So for this first EAC seminar, I've chosen to talk about cement and CO2. And unfortunately, this is an area where a lot of people have misconceptions. So what I've tried to do is um, highlight what are really the facts in this matter and talk a little bit about what we can do to reduce the CO2 for cement. Now, we know that global warming is a very pressing problem and it's really one of the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So this uh, countdown here shows that within as little as 25 years, we will have an amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which is calculated to lead to a global warming of two degrees. And if we look at the so-called 1.5 degree scenario, we'll see we're exceeding the uh, amount of CO2 in as little as seven years. And this means that clearly in the long run, we're gonna to have to find technologies that actually can take CO2 out of the atmosphere. But the more we can do now, the more we can save by um, reducing the CO2 in the atmosphere. So many of the things I'm gonna talk about here can be found in this report, which is easily available online. And um, I'll give other references at the end of the presentation. So we hear so much about the fact that cementitious materials emit between five and 10% of CO2, but we have to realize that this is purely due to the fact that they're the most used materials in the world. There's more cement, cementitious materials used than all other materials put together. Uh, this was the figure we um, put in our UN report, but in fact, the solid blue, which we had in that report is probably an underestimate. That's why I've put in this shaded uh, blue portion here. And in the last few decades, the use of cement has really taken off uh, compared to other materials, notably because of the growth in China, the uh, building of high-speed railways, uh, houses, etc., And we cannot see this um, changing completely because of course there's a big need for houses and infrastructure by people uh, around the world. Now we see also in this graph that the amounts of other materials are quite small. So if we take the example of wood, today this is about 10% of the amount of cementitious materials, and already we're cutting down more forests than we're planting. If we wanted to replace 25% of cementitious materials with timber, this would require planting a forest one and a half times the size of India. Now, in fact, cementitious materials are low energy and low CO2 on a equivalent weight or volume basis. Uh, you can see down here this figure from the books of Mike Ashby that um, concrete has really the lowest emissions, much lower than materials like, cl like clay bricks and tiles, uh, even timber, and certainly much less than plastics. The CO2 emissions from cement um, we need to look where these come from. Um, now, one ton of clinker today leads to emissions of between 750 and 900 kilos of CO2. We can say on average, this is about 850 kilos per ton. And the minority, about 40%, comes from the fuel used to produce the clinker. So clinker is produced in a cement kiln like this at a temperature of 1450 degrees. Um, it looks a rather old fashioned technology, but this is in fact uh, highly optimized. Uh, modern state of the art kilns can be up to 80% of thermodynamics, thermodynamic limit. And it's estimated that it's un there are unlikely to be savings of more than 2% when we look at the best available technology. Of course, we can save uh, CO2 by replacing old inefficient cement plants by new ones. And the other advantage of this cement kiln is that rather than using fossil fuels, we can um, get rid of a lot of waste materials, waste plastics, for example, can be efficiently and safely disposed of in the cement kiln and their calorific value uh, used uh, usefully. The majority of the emissions, 60%, come from this chemical equation here. 
So limestone makes up about 80% of the raw material for cement. And the first stage in the production of the clinker is the breakdown of this calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and CO2. And that's where the majority of the CO2 emissions come from. So we can't solve that problem by, for example, uh, using renewable energies. So let's look at the possibilities to produce other clinkers. Now here, we're ultimately restricted by the materials we have on Earth. And it's quite remarkable to realize that when we look at the Earth's crust, 98% of this is made up of just eight elements, which are oxygen, silicon, aluminium, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium. So clearly there's no point looking at all the other elements in this remaining 2% because we simply don't have the amounts uh, needed. This would be much too, too expensive. Now, when we look at these eight elements, we need to consider how cement works. So the essential uh, way cement works is that we start off with this gray powder, we mix it with water. And at the beginning, the grains are floating around uh, in water. And this is a very useful property because it means we have this flowable concrete, which we can transport, we can put in molds before it starts to set and harden. Inside this cement paste, the chemical process going on are first of all, the dissolution of the cement grains, the elements which are in those cement grains go into the water as different ions and then essentially those ions can recombine in different combinations, combinations which now include water in the solid structure, they precipitate what I've drawn in red here as these hydrates and these hydrates hold the different grains together. They fill the space that was originally occupied by water and so they give a strong porous solid. Now, when we go back to this composition of the earth and we look at the different oxides, the problem with the oxides of sodium and potassium, are these are too soluble. So they dissolve, but they don't precipitate hydrates. On the other hand, the oxides of iron and magnesium, these have too low solubility. So for example, in this 30 year old concrete here, these bright regions are where the iron was in the original clinker. And in 30 years, it just stayed in the same place. It didn't go into the spaces between the grains and contribute to the development of strength. Similarly with magnesium, uh, magnesium is present in slags and in this slag cement uh, blend here, here are the slag grains, they're surrounded by these uh, dark rims because these rims contain the magnesium, which didn't, again, didn't move around. So we come down to this system of just three oxides, which of course is very well known and has been studied for hundreds of years. And in this system, we know there are only two regions where we have hydraulic materials which can be used to produce cements. We have this region on the left here, which is calcium silicates, which is what we call Portland cement. And we have this region here, which is calcium aluminate, calcium sulfur aluminate cements. Now, at first sight, this region looks very interesting because it's further from this calcium oxide corner. And that means it contains less calcium oxide. And remember, it was that calcium oxide that was associated with most of the CO2. So these type of cements do have lower CO2 emissions, but unfortunately, there's another problem because in order to make them, we need minerals which contain much more alumina compared to silica. And this type of minerals are much rarer on earth. We have bauxite. This is a much more localized mineral. And of course it's used for producing aluminum, which makes it expensive. But that's not the end of the story because even if we took all the current bauxite production, we could still only replace 10 to 15% of the demand for cement. And that would mean we'd have no aluminum. So 
clearly this is not really feasible in any large quantity. And as an example, after nearly 50 years of producing calcium sulfur aluminate cements in China, these represent less than one tenth of 1% of the production of Portland cement. And this proportion is actually going down because of the expense, because of the technical difficulties. Demand is forecast to increase. And today, more than nine, about 90% of demand is outside the most developed OECD countries. Uh, we see more than half of demand is in China and China is now uh, calculated to have peaked, demand is falling, but there are other countries, notably India, countries in Africa, South America, which are developing and looking to improve the quality of living of their citizens, which of course requires building with concrete as the best choice of material. Um, as an example, the consumption of cement today in India is about five times less than China. So we can really see there's a lot of uh, demand going to come there. And this means that in order to be implemented, solutions have to be practical. May, much cement around the world is made like this. It's uh, batched uh, by volume and often with a simple cement mixer or maybe even uh, just by uh, using a spade. And we need to have solutions which can be used in the same way as this in order that they will be taken up. They also need to be economically viable. We can't imagine solutions which would cost 10 or even 100 times the cost of cement today. So let's look at the prospects for reducing the CO2 emissions of cement. And before I talk about um, you know, things that can work, I, I want to talk about things that can't work because many of the roadmaps that have been written um, still say that a lot of cement reduction, CO2 reduction is gonna come from breakthroughs. And unfortunately, most of those breakthroughs are somewhere between um, alchemy and magical thinking because cement is a solid material that has to come from the earth. People cannot live in nano or virtual houses. So, um, you know, let's look at what really uh, can happen and, and what really does not work. Now, the most common fallacy we have to realize comes from this CO2 cycle. So we've talked about limestone, and almost all calcium in the Earth's crust is in the, already in the form of calcium carbonate. And during production, this limestone breaks down. We have the emissions of CO2. We then have the calcium oxide, which goes on to be uh, combined with silica or alumina in the clinker phases. And then those clinker phases react with water. This is the hydration. This gives us, for example, calcium hydroxide, also other hydrates like calcium silicate hydrates, etc. And over time, slowly, the material will actually reabsorb CO2. This is known as carbonation. But of course, the amount of CO2 that can be reabsorbed here can never be greater than the amount of CO2 which was given off here. Now, as I've said, almost all the calcium in the Earth's crust is in the form of calcium carbonate. Uh, Seawater does contain some calcium, but because it's very dilute, one would have to for handle very large volumes of water, which of course uh, is, it becomes extremely expensive. So the most common fallacy we have, which is behind many startups, is to say, well, we can solve this problem of atmospheric CO2, by letting this atmospheric CO2 react with calcium oxide or calcium hydroxide. And of course that will happen, but the problem is where do you get that calcium oxide or hydroxide from in the first place? If it came from calcium carbonate, then you don't have any net benefit. And similarly, many microorganisms or bacteria can also form calcium carbonate from atmospheric CO2 but as well as the atmospheric CO2, they need again calcium oxide. And where do you get that calcium oxide from? Only if it was originally uncarbonated does it have any net benefit. 
Now, there are some waste materials like high calcium fly ash, um, some slags which contain uncal uncarbonated calcium. These are in relative small amounts. And in fact, if you want to use those uncarbonated sources of calcium, a very simple and effective way to do it is to use them as alternative raw materials to produce clinker. Then we have solutions like the much touted alkali activated materials, sometimes called geopolymers. We have to realize that most formulations used in practice, which work at ambient temperature, contain slag or high calcium fly ash. And as we're going to see in more detail, the amounts of these materials is very limited. Slag, for example, today is about 8% of cement production, and 95% of that slag produced today is already used efficiently in blended cements or added to concrete. So if we take that slag that's already been used very effectively out of the concretes, and we put it into these alkali activated materials. Um, well, we may say those alkali activated materials have lower CO2 emissions, but of course, then we have to put in activator. So overall, there's no net benefit. In fact, we may increase worldwide CO2 emissions. And this is not to mention the many unsolved technical problems, fast set, lack of effective admixtures, high shrinkage, etc. And I think we have to really confront the fact that over the last 40 years, we've wasted many billions of dollars and unfortunately many young brains on this idea. And we need those research funds, we need those ideas to really be dedicated to effective solutions. Calcium sulfur illuminate cements also be like yellamite ferrite cements, uh, I'm not going to talk about in detail because I've already explained that here the problem is lack of high alumina resources. We then have some interesting uh, solutions like these carbonating calcium silicate cements, which, for example, are what is um, being done by the company Solidia. Um, and these can have quite a substantial CO2 reduction because they're based on clinker for example, wellastonite with a lower content of calcium, therefore lower CO2. And they absorb the CO2 during the reaction process. Now, the limitations on these kind of technologies are really the following. You, need, you can only produce relatively small elements because you need to get the CO2 to penetrate into the samples. Uh, then you have a carbonated material, so you can't really use conventional reinforcing steel. You need to have them produced in a factory where you can have a carbonation chamber and you need to channel the CO2 sources. So they can be a good solution, but probably won't penetrate more than a few percent of the market. Then people talk a lot about magnesium based cements. Uh, Magnesium, if these are based on magnesium carbonates, you're really not going to save anything because magnesium carbonates give off more CO2 per ton than calcium silicates. Um, calcium silicates, people have looked at the technology to separate the calcium silicates involve high temperatures and pressures, and there's no way to do this in any way economically at, or scale at scale. Magnesium silicates are relatively abundant, but they're much more localized than limestone. So it would entail probably deep mining operations, et cetera. And you still have a carbonated material with low, C low pH, and therefore the same constraints as we've just seen for the carbonatable calcium silicates. So we really have to accept the fact that materials based on Portland cement are going to continue to dominate. And by far and away, the most realistic option to reduce CO2 is to use blended cements, where we replace a lot of the Portland cement clinker with other materials. And of course, this is nothing new. We've been using these so-called supplementary cementitious materials, SCMs, for many decades now. The problem is the classical SEMs that are the most thought about, fly ash and slag, are today only around 15% of current cement production. 
And that is going to go down in the future because they come from carbon, carbon intensive processes. Fly ash, for example, comes from burning coal, which produces 60% of CO2 emissions today. So clearly has to be something we stop doing uh, in order to confront climate change. Um, what other materials do we have available? Well, things like silica fume, waste glass, vegetable fly ashes, again, the amounts are in very, very small. So they're not going to go very far in solving this issue. We do have very large amounts of limestone, and this is already the most used supplementary cementitious material. But when we go beyond substitution levels of more than about 15%, we just have a simple dilution, which means that we have to use more cement in the concrete, so we don't really have any net, net saving. What we do have, which is a real potential breakthrough, are clays, which can be calcined, that's to say heated to around 800 degrees, um, and these are super abundant around the world. Now, this has led to the interesting technology. We've been pioneering at EPFL, the so-called LC3 concept. LC3 stands for limestone calcine clay cements, because what we've found here is that by putting limestone together with calcine clay, we can go to very high substitution levels with very good performance. So just to summarize here, um, you know, we have typical Portland cement, which is 95% clinker and 5% gypsum. We have pozzolanic cements where the pozzolan may be fly ash, but may also be calcined clay. Typically the highest level of substitution is around 30%. Now we go to LC3, we replace a further 15% of the relatively energy intensive clinker by very low CO2 emitting limestone. And as we see on the right here, we can at earlier seven days get the same or higher strength than the reference Portland cement. So with this material, we have 50% clinker. This equates to about 40% less CO2. Of course, we've taken into account the energy that's required for calcining the clay. We have similar strength and some properties like chloride resistance, resistance to alkali silica reaction are very much improved. Now, I'm not gonna say much more about LC3 technology. We're hoping to feature that in, a, in another EAC seminar, just to show you that this is not just a lab-based idea. Here are some of the products and demonstration house which have been built with this. In this house alone, we could save more than 15 tons of CO2 compared to existing solutions. Now, if we look at this supplementary cementitious materials in general, because you know, we not only want to use calcined clay, of course, we want to keep using slag and fly ash. This, the potential of this is really very large. If we look at the roadmap that was done by the International Energy Agency in 2009 for the Cement Sustainability Initiative of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, they calculated that the supply of the currently used supplementary cementitious materials would be limited to about 1.2 billion tons a year, which would mean that the lowest clinker factor we could go to on an average worldwide would be about 73%. And the contribution of these clinker substitutes would be just this thin green line here. Now, if we remove that limitation on supplementary cementitious materials, which would be easy to do with calcined clay, then I think most people agree we could go easily to an cl average clinker factor of about 60% worldwide, and this would give this extra saving of about 400 million tons of CO2 every year, which is this very big green component here. 400 million tons of CO2 a year, to give you an idea, it's like 10 times the entire emissions of Switzerland where I'm working. Um, it's like 1% of the whole world CO2 emission. It may not sound like a lot, but we only need 100 ideas like that to solve the problem. And I think if we really looked at optimizing the clinker factor, we could even imagine by 2050 to go down to a clinker factor of 
45%, uh, uh, this could save another further 400 million tons of CO2, which would be like 2% of the whole world's CO2 emissions. Now, of course, we can't stop there. I've talked today about what we can do on the cement level, but we have to understand that cement is just one part of the value chain. And if we really want to maximize what we can do to reduce CO2, we need to work throughout that value chain. We need to work, first of all, at the clinker. This has already been done. Clinker is now produced much more efficiently than it was 40, 50 years ago. We then need to reduce the clinker in the cement, which can be done with supplementary cementitious materials. But we also need to think about how much cement we use in concrete, because here there's a lot of waste going on due to things as simple like poor aggregate grading, not using admixtures. We can also use fillers to replace some cement in some concrete. And then we need to reduce the concrete in the buildings and we need to use our buildings more efficiently. And of course, this is not to forget recycling when we eventually demolish buildings. So to give you an idea of the range of cement used in concretes for identical concrete strength, here is the data that was put together by the group from University of Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, 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 10 years ago. And the range between the most efficient cement concrete with the lowest cement content and the least efficient is a factor of like one to four. And generally site mixing is rather inefficient. Already moving to ready mix on an industrial scale, we have a big gain in inefficiently. Now these mixtures today are generally limited by this minimum cement content in most codes, which is typically around 250 kilos per meter cube. But many people, many research groups around the world have actually developed concretes which can go to much lower uh, cement contents still down to nearly half this 250 li uh, uh, limit. And if these can be accepted by the codes, we have potential for halving again the amount of cement in concrete, halving again the CO2 level. And when we look at buildings, it's very much the same story that between the best and the worst, there's a very big spread. This was a survey that was done in Singapore, which we talk about in the UN report. And you see between the most efficient here and the least efficient here, there's four times more concrete being used to produce the same floor area of the building. And finally, just a couple of words on carbon capture and storage, because as I said at the beginning, we will need this in the long run, long run because we will overshoot these targets of CO2 in the atmosphere. But this is going to be very expensive and implementing things we can do fast and at scale will really save us a lot of money in the long run. It's not just a question of cost, it's also a question of logistics, uh, technical and social issues. This is a map taken from a U, uh, from a uh, European report on the kind of pipeline infrastructure would which would have to be installed in order to move CO2 from the places it's captured uh, either to offshore or onshore uh, sites where it can be uh, stored. So just to summarize, um, I hope you've uh, managed to um, understand the main points of the presentation. First and foremost, cement and concrete are low to a CO2 materials and their overall impact is only due to the enormous amount used. There is no viable alternative. So really we have to work on lowering the CO2 emissions of cement. What we can do is limited by the composition of the earth and Portland cement really remains the best option as the basis. But we do have this huge potential to further lower CO2 by increasing the use of supplementary cementitious materials. Calcine clay is the important thing because this enables us to go beyond the limits imposed by the availability of slag and fly ash and really to fully realize what the savings we can make 
we need to work through this value chain of clinker, cement, concrete, structures, recycling. Carbon capture and storage may be needed, but they will be high cost. So we really have a very strong interest to do what we can in other ways first. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope now we can have an interesting question and answer session um, to follow up on um, some of the points. Thank you very much.